Okay, so if we have a mechanical system uh, like this one, we can uh, make a mathematical model of it by um, constructing a state space. Now a state space in this case would be something that would incorporate position about both incorporate information both about position and velocity of the rotors here and then the uh, forces acting on the the rotors determine some flow uh, F sub T and the basic question we want to deal with is what behaviors are possible that is as you if you start in some particular initial position what how does the uh, behavior develop with time uh, okay so uh, we want to know what behaviors are possible for points under this flow, F sub t. Well, it's, maybe it's useful to, to say when two points, two points behave in the same way. Let's say that two points are forward asymptotic. If the uh, paths in phase space get closer and closer together as t goes into infinity. Okay, so this defines some sort of uh, equivalence relation or partition on the space X of initial conditions. Okay, and we could rephrase our question as to understanding this partition on, this, on the space X. Of course, we also would get a partition if we consider behavior in backward time. So we have two partitions that we'd like to understand and also we want to understand the relationship between these two partitions. Okay. Um, so a lot of times flows uh, arise naturally as in this example, but there's a closely related um, mathematical model where you deal with uh, diffeomorphisms rather than flows. Okay, so this is just a case of using, replacing the group R, an R action by a Z action, which I think is just a question of going from uh, global fields to function fields in any case. Um, so we'll go from uh, R action to a Z action. And let me give you an example here of a, um, of, uh, a diffeomorphism here. So a diffeomorphism we want to, we, we're iterating and we want to, again, we can talk about the partition based on uh, uh, being forward, asympt forward asymptotic behavior. Let's see, I need, Okay, so here's the picture. I'll explain this. Okay, so um, the idea, what you're supposed to think about here is that uh, <coughs> these kind of horizontal looking lines here correspond to points who, for which which, uh, whose forward orbits are bounded. Okay, so we iterate in forward time, these points are bounded, and the kind of vertical lines correspond to points whose, <coughs> whose orbits are bounded. By orbits, I just mean the iteration. Orbits are bounded in, in backward time. Now, uh, in this case, this is a particularly nice case um, where the, if we look, if we call K plus, here, this is it call K plus a set of points with bounded forward orbits, then this partition, this forward asymptotic partition, the partition de determined by the forward behavior, actually gives us the lamination of K plus. Okay, so the, the leaves of this lamination are, are manifolds here. They're what, what are called stable manifolds, consisting of points which are converging, we're getting closer in, in forward time. Okay, so this is a nice example because it um, can be worked out pretty easily. There, it corresponds to certain values here of the constants A and C. Um, I forget which ones exactly. Um, but this is a nice example, but it's, in a sense it's a kind of a special example. It's special because this, this map has a certain, certain special dynamical features. Okay, this is a, an example of a hyperbolic dynamical system, and it's the hyperbolicity that gives us this laminar structure for, for these sets. Okay, um, so let me say what hyperbolicity is, an important notion in dynamics. Uh, 
hyperbolicity in general involves um, uh, uniform expansion, it involves a, uh, a choice of directions at each point. There's expanding directions and contracting directions, so in this case, the directions are given by the directions of these lines here in the lamination. Uh, we require that the uh, map be uniformly expanding in forward time, uniformly contracting in the uh, stable, stable directions, and that there's some transversality between the stable and unstable directions, so that the stable and unstable directions don't coincide. Okay, now that's an, um, an un <coughs> I'm saying this is not the general case. Um, in the general case, these uh, partitions are wilder than lam laminations. Let me use uh, uh, Misha Lubitsch's term, who calls them turbulations, right? If you think of a lamination as corresponding to some kind of laminar flow, then a turbulation might correspond to some kind of turbulent flow, right? So that we don't necessarily get leaves. If we get leaves, they don't necessarily fit together in a nice lamination. They might have lots of folds. So the, the general object that we have to deal with is, uh, can be much worse than a lamination. Okay, so um, as <clears throat> so the problem here then is to develop a theory of uh, dynamical systems, some kind of uh, mathematical theory. The, the hope would be you could get a, some kind of theory that would apply to all diffeomorphisms, to the, the, the space of all diffeomorphisms. Uh, this was a seemed like a good idea back um, when for, in the 60s, for example, when Smale was, was thinking about these things. It, it seemed like a good idea, but it, it's too hard. It's apparently too hard. Uh, there are just too many wild uh, diffeomorphisms where uh, uh, theoretical ideas just don't seem, the theoretical ideas that uh, were around just didn't seem to apply. So uh, a, a second strategy here in developing such a theory is to focus on some subset of diffeomorphisms, not, the, not all diffeomorphisms, but some subset of diffeomorphisms for which we can develop a nice theory, and yet at the same time we hope that this subset is rather large in the space of diffeomorphisms. So a good candidate subset would be the space of, be the collection of hyperbolic diffeomorphisms. Okay, well, um, it turns out that uh, we, it was possible in the 60s and 70s to develop a very good theory of hyperbolic diffeomorphisms, um, but uh, as people looked more and more closely, the uh, discovered that the set of hyperbolic diffeomorphisms was uh, not as large as they hoped. It seemed to uh, <coughs> encompass a smaller and smaller set of, of, the, of diffeomorphisms the more people looked. So it's, to develop a really satisfactory theory of dynamics, you really need to do more than the hyperbolic case. Okay, you need to um, work more generally. Okay, so... Um, well, um, new tools are required, things, tools that will push beyond the hyperbolic situation. People don't know exactly what those tools are yet, but a lot of things are being considered. Um, let me talk about, so, uh, a, a third retreat here from the, from the grand goal is to um, simply deal with some nice model family of diffeomorphisms, say given by a finite number of parameters, and think of this parameter space now as some sort of stand-in for the space of diffeomorphisms. Perhaps we can apply some uh, special techniques to study this family and get some hint as to the general picture uh, for all diffeomorphisms, perhaps eventually um, extending from our finite, fam our finite dimensional family to more general, um, more general diffeomorphisms. Okay, so one good choice for a, uh, a family of diffeomorphisms to look at 
is the, the Hainan family. So the Hainan family was introduced by the uh, astronomer Hainan, who was uh, modeling, uh, was interested in modeling turbulent fluid flow, and they took the equations for turbulent fluid flow, and which are infinite equations, infinite dimensional, involve some kind of infinite dimensional dynamical system, approximated by a finite dimensional dynamical system, finite dimensional flow. That still turned out to be too, uh, too difficult to simulate, <clears throat> but um, it was apparent to him that what was causing the interesting dynamics were, was two, two phenomena. One was a stretching phenomena that um, <clears throat> lengths get expanded, another was a folding phenomena. So he, he simply decided to find the simplest map he could think of which, behave, which exhibited both this stretching and folding behavior. Uh, so, um, since it really is true that stretching and folding are key mechanisms in creating chaotic dynamics, this is a good family of maps to look at. Okay, so the nature of these maps is that there is some, some box in our phase space. Our phase space is now the plane, which is stretched and folded through itself. Okay, if the, and how it, the box falls through itself depends on the parameters, and particularly the, the C parameter in this equation. So this would be one example, this on, would be one example over here, this would be one example over here where the box goes all the way through itself, which would correspond to this kind of hyperbolic behavior over here, um, this horseshoe map. In fact, the horseshoe map is, is one of these Hainan maps. But if the box does not go all the way through itself, then what we, then what this, so the characteristic feature here of the, of the horseshoe is that the bends kind of move off to infinity as you iterate the map. That's not the only possibility. The other possibility is that the bends kind of accumulate on themselves. You get more and more bending as, um, as you iterate um, and that, so that instead of getting these nice leaves, you get things that are folded in, the, in a messy fashion. So that if you get this accumulation of bends, it's definitely you're in the non-hyperbolic situation. So that's really the, the cutting edge here. What we'd really like to understand is that non-hyperbolic situation. So here's a picture of, from Hainon's paper <coughs> showing uh, a set here which you can think of as some kind of something like a uh, an unstable manifold, but it, with a lot of bends. I mean, presumably the closer and closer you look at this, the more you, you see bends on all scales. Okay, so something that fails to be a lamination. Pardon? When is this paper? Uh, um, 68. 68. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now the. Uh, the Hainan family here has a special feature, which is not the reason, I mean, it was a special feature with just kind of a, uh, an artifact here. It's not the reason it was introduced, but the special feature, since it's given by polynomials, it has an extension to C2, so an extension from R2 to C2. Okay, so um, here's the question. Is it fair to, uh, I mean, we really want to understand these diffeomorphisms of the plane. Now this particular family of diffeomorphisms corresponds to something, there's some bigger kind of dynamics going on in C2. Is it fair to use this fact that we have this complex extension? Um, well this, I think this, this question, this, this separates people according to their background. If you're, uh, uh, you know, if you're an algebraic geometer, right, you say, naturally, of course we want to start with a complex case, understand the complex case, and then, uh, then we'll work on the real case. Uh, if you study dynamics in one, one variable, you also say, yes, naturally, we want to study the complex case, because one variable complex dynamics has been very fruitful. If you're in dynamical systems, you say, Wait a minute, no, don't do that. I mean, the, the, in dynamical systems, this is a, seems like a, a, a problematic thing to do. 
partly because you're introducing some structure here that you don't, that is not possessed by the general diffeomorphism. But we'll throw caution to the wind here and go ahead and uh, exploit this complex structure. So we're going to consider uh, maps from C2 to C2. Now if we take our parameters A and B to be real, then we can think of these maps. There is an R2 inside of the C2 on which we're observing the standard Hainan map. Right? We can also take our parameters to be complex. In that case, there is no invariant Hainan map, but sometimes it's, but we do certainly get an interesting dynamical system, and it's certainly a dynamical system that involves stretching and folding, though not the sort of that Hainan had imagined. Okay. Well, here's the here's what here's the advantage of considering these. Uh, complex extensions, right? If you're an algebraic geometer, somehow the complex varieties have the full structure, right? There's something extra <coughs> regular about the theory of the complex varieties. Um, and we'll, and in this case, there is something <coughs> regular about the behavior of these complex Hainan diffeomorphisms. In fact, one branch of the hyperbolic theory this, this theory developed for laminations and, and things, goes through in this uh, complex Hainan case. So what we'll see in this case is a way of extending some of the theory of laminations to these more complicated objects, these turbulations. But in order to do, to do this, we have to be in the complex, the complex setting. OK, so let me um, start by, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the theory, the, the uh, hyperbolic theory, okay? So as a way of motivating the results that I want to describe here. Um, so if you have a lamination, we've seen in previous talks discussion, it's useful to discuss transverse structures for this lamination, the transverse Riemannian structure, etc. Well, one, one useful uh, object to look at is transverse measures. Okay, so think of a transverse measure as being a family of measures defined on transversals to the lamination, which is invariant under holonomy. Okay, so holonomy is a map from one transversal to another that you get by sliding along the leaves. Okay, so um, for hyperbolic diffeomorphisms, uh, like the horseshoe, there are, trans, there are natural transverse measures. There is a, a stable and an unstable transverse measure. A transverse measure for the uh, unstable lamination and a transverse measure for the stable lamination. Okay, these are often called Margulis measures. Um, he looked at them in a slightly different context. Um, okay. <clears throat> but they, they exist very generally for hyperbolic s systems. Um, they have uh, a number of nice properties. One thing, one interesting, one property that they have is that um, they're, they, they're uniquely ergodic. That is, they tend to be there. <coughs> if you have a system like the horseshoe here, there's a unique transverse invariant measure, right? So you can think of them as not something something that's defined just based, something that just depends on the lamination, right? It's not something that requires the dynamics at all. It's just simply comes from the geometry of the lamination. <clears throat> With these two stable and unstable transverse measures, you can uh, take a wedge, take, take a, uh, a product of these measures, and kind of in the sense of Fubini, and describe, and and produce an actual measure on your, in this case, on the horseshoe. Okay, so you can somehow combine these measures, take the product of these stable and unstable measures to produce a, a measure on, the, on your basic set, which in this case is the horseshoe. Maybe you can explain what a horseshoe means. Kind of sense. <clears throat> yeah, the, the uh, right. So I guess the horseshoe here, this is, Examples often called the horseshoe. Uh, when I say the horseshoe, I'm really thinking about the, the intersection here of the, of the stable and unstable sets 
the Cantor set of you get where these where these laminations intersect here. Okay, so um, yeah, in this case, it's the set of it's the set of points with bounded forward and backward orbits. Okay, um, so one of the there are a number of interesting properties of this this product measure called the Bowen measure. Let me give you one one of the interesting properties, which is that this Bowen measure, if we call it mu sub b, it describes the distribution of periodic points in the following sense. If we let p sub n be the set of periodic points uh, of period n, okay, so in fact these are, in this case these are saddle periodic points, they have an unstable manifold and a stable manifold, then um, we can uh, turn that set into an analytic object by placing a Dirac mass at each of those points. We can normalize that so that it has total mass 1. And then if we think of that as a measure, and we take the limit as the period increases, it converges to this Bowen measure mu sub b. Okay, so in that sense, so that's the sense in which the Bowen measure describes the distribution of periodic points. The Bowen measure, if you take some subset of the horseshoe, the Bowen measure of that subset is the percentage of periodic points in that subset. In this, in this sense. Okay, so we would like to extend this theory to our, from laminations to our turbulations. Well, we need uh, an alternate method of, some alternate tools here to do this. The, the hyperbolic techniques definitely do not work um, in, our, in our context. Okay, so let me describe, in general, one way of constructing this Margulis measure is to take a take a variety, let me get the, um, I want to get the non-permanent markers here in case I want to use this transparency again. If we take a variety and we start iterating it in the forward, or iterating it in the forward direction say, it gets long and thin and starts approaching this uh, unstable lamination. Okay, so one way of constructing this um, one way of constructing this Margulis measure. Okay, thanks. One way of constructing this Margulis measure. <coughs> so we take take some variety and start iterating it. One way of constructing this Margulis measure is to consider uh, a transversal and count the intersections with our variety. Okay, and then look at that, normalize that, and um, um, take the limit as, as we iterate further and further. Okay, so this gives us some sort of measure which is almost visually holonomy invariant here because these varieties are close to the unstable manifold. So it's almost, it should be invariant under holonomy. So that's a, that is in fact a method of constructing the um, Margulis measure. Okay, so we'd like to um, <coughs> like to do some analog of that uh, in our um, in our complex Hanon setting. Okay, so the trick here is to well, so here what would what would we like to do? We would like to take, if we think of our variety as some set V, what we would like to take is somehow the fundamental cohomology class of V and start iterating that class. Okay, the, the cohomology class counts, if you evaluate the cohomology class on a transversal, it counts intersections. So we'd like to take this cohomology class and iterate it and hope in some sense that cohomology class might convert, I mean, iterate it and normalize it and hope in some sense that cohomology class might converge. Okay, so we can't do that using singular cohomology, as far as I know, but um, pluripotential theory does provide 
that provides tools that make this possible. So this is the, uh, I think this is interesting from a topologist perspective here. There is some, there is some point to analysis after all. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, let's consider it for our variety. Let's take our variety to be a polynomial variety. And okay, that works out particularly nicely in this case. Now, um, okay, what I want to, um, what I want to look at is a, so if we take our variety, one nice thing about a polynomial variety is, a polynomial variety is you have the polynomial to play with here. So if we take the polynomial, this is a, say a complex polynomial, look at its modulus and take log of that, we get some function which is uh, some function on C2. Okay, so the, um, <clears throat> the idea is we, if we apply certain differential operators to that, we get some, uh, some, some, <clears throat> some current. Now in fact, uh, so this is a, these are differential operators we're applying to a function which is not differentiable, so to make sense of this, we have to think in the space, not in the space of functions, but in the space of currents, okay? But that's just some, we can think of that as just giving us some topology on the space of, of uh, one forms. So let me explain the, the geometric content of this operator DDC. So uh, to look at a simple example, let's look at a very simple example where we're actually in the complex plane and let's take our polynomial, our variety to be the point zero and our polynomial to be just the function p of z is equal to z. Okay, in this case, if we look at, so log p is some radially symmetric function on the complex plane. If we take d of it, we get a one form. And if I just draw the, the foliation determined by that one form, right, the foliation given by the kernel of the one form, we, it's just, we get these circles, circles around the origin. Now, D, the C here in, in this operator DC says apply the exterior derivative. Okay, this is just as you would for a one form. And then the C means rotate by 90 degrees. Okay, in the complex setting, that's well defined. We know what that means, to rotate by 90 degrees. Well, if you take this form and rotate by 90 degrees, instead of getting a form which is measuring distance from the origin, you get a form which measures angle, right? Measures radial direction, okay? So, in particular, it's no longer a, um, uh, so this form is exact and this one is no longer exact. Okay, so in particular, this, this, the form that you get here measures winding number around the origin, right? Or if I divide it by two pi, it measures winding number. Okay, now if we um, think not about the, uh, now if we go to the next level of complexity here and think of our polynomial P in C2, then uh, we can do the same thing. Again, we, ha we can talk about exterior derivatives, we have the operator D, and we know what it means to rotate by, by I here. So this, <coughs> this form, DDC of P, it's just the linking form in C2, right? It, in, in the plane, it tells you how you wrap around the origin. Here, it tells us how we wrap around the variety, okay? So, uh, okay. So it's the linking form, and if you evaluate it on some disk, right, the linking number of the boundary just tells you how many times the, the disk itself intersects the variety, okay? So this, so, so DDC, represents the fundamental cohomology class of the variety. Okay. Now, uh, here, let me just... Um, okay. So we want to show that these <coughs> forms converge somehow. Let's see. Uh, uh, in potential theory, um, let's see, so let me say that a, uh, a potential function for a current nu 
is a function h so that ddc of h is equal to nu. Okay, so we've seen some examples here of potential functions. Uh, log of <coughs> log of absolute value of p, p, t, p is the potential function for v. If we want to iterate, p, iterate this variety v, here I'm going to pull it back. If we want to pull it back by f to the n, then uh, this is the corresponding potential function. Okay, so the idea here to show that these currents converge is to show that the potential functions converge. Okay, this is a standard trick, sneaky trick in potential theory, but um, it's it it's neat. It does things you can't do other does things you can't do other ways. Okay, so um, let's. Okay, so let, we want to iterate these potential functions, or consider these sequence of potential functions, and normalize them, and see what we get. To see what the limit should be of these potential functions, here, now let me specialize, again, and take v to be the y-axis, so I'm going to be iterating the y-axis backwards. In that case, the polynomial that determines this variety is just the first, the projection on the first coordinate. Okay, so what do we get? If we take log of p composed with f to the n, so it's log of that's the first coordinate of the nth iterate of the map. Okay, let's assume that x is large and that x is bigger than y. If you recall the definition of our function, I, I, I don't recall it, but I'll find it soon. Okay, if you recall the definition of our function, Okay, so if you iterate this, <coughs> this is the term that dominates, right? This term, this, the square term dominates everything else. So what you're essentially doing is just squaring the first coordinate each time so that f to the n <coughs> of x, y looks very much like x to the 2 to the nth power. <coughs> and here you get x to the 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, so... Uh, this suggests what the proper normalization should be. Okay, if we want these things to converge, so if we want these things to converge, then um, we should, let's see, no, this is not a 1 over 2 to the n, right? That's a 2 to the n. All right, so this is a 2 to the n times log of x. So if we want these things to converge, we should divide out by 2 to the n. That seems to be the proper normalization. Okay, and in fact, these, these potential functions do converge. So we it will take that to be our definition. We'll define this function g plus to be the limit of these properly normalized potential functions. Okay, and then the this g plus is itself the potential function of some current and that current is this current mu plus, just defined by that statement. Okay, and this current mu plus, so the, the, the punchline here is that these varieties will converge in the sense of currents to this current mu plus. Okay, so somehow we've managed to create convergence of varieties by some system here which is ignoring the small scale structure, ignoring the folds enough. The folds are, the folds are there, but they're not getting in our way here. So that, um, well, and the other, so the other interesting thing is we're, we're both ignoring the folds and somehow the, the mechanism that's really, that's, that's helpful here, curiously enough, is the behavior of the function, the iterates, a long way away from the interesting set, right? That is. <clears throat> these points here, well, somehow this, this function g, g plus, <clears throat> the value of g plus at any given point depends on the rate of escape of that point, right? We're looking at the, the growth of the iterates. So somehow the, the behavior of our function at infinity is giving us some structure in this, this set k plus, or the set where the of points with bounded orbits. Okay, so um, to make that precise, now 
uh, we chose a particular a particular variety here, but in fact it works for any variety, for any algebraic variety, if you iterate in this fashion, then these currents, these kind of fundamental cohomology classes of the variety converge in the sense of currents to some positive multiple times the current mu plus. Okay. Um, all right. So let me back up here and give you some, a little bit of, uh, so that's, that's the, the mechanism here for kind of developing this, this measure theory of these turbulations. Let me back up a little, a little bit and give you some background here. Um, in the horseshoe example, the, the interesting set that is this, is this set K plus, that is the set on which we see a one-dimensional expanding and one-dimensional contracting direction, this K plus, the set K plus, in general, our, our map, if our map has uh, sinks, for example, that's not the right definition of the interesting set. So we define the set J plus and minus to be the boundary of these sets K plus and minus. And so um, these, cor these correspond to these laminations in this particular picture and J to be their intersection. Okay, so J plays the role in, in the case of complex Hainault maps, plays the role of an index one basic set in for hyperbolic, for hyperbolic maps. Okay, I mean I like. Okay, so here's here's a general picture of what might be going what might be going on. Um, we have a set. If, for example, there's a a fixed sink here, then the set of points that are attracted to this sink will be inside K plus. They will have bounded forward orbits but it'll be in the interior K plus, okay? So the set of points with, inter with um, interesting dynamics or uh, stable and unstable directions will be the boundary, consist of the boundary of K plus intersected with the boundary of K minus. Okay, we call that set J. Okay, now um, we can use this potential theory to to show that J is, that these currents are actually converging as sets, they're converging to the set, uh, set J plus or J minus, um, be, let's see, because the, the sets J plus and J minus are precisely the supports of these currents mu plus and mu minus. In fact, we can think of the, um, the functions G plus and G minus as, as green functions for the sets J plus and J minus, very, as in um, John Hubbard's talk yesterday. Okay, so these are the same, same functions that we're considering the G plus and G minus. He was using these to analyze what's going on outside of K plus. In this case, we're using these to analog, analyze what's going on on the boundary of K plus. Okay, so I want to explain, uh, so it's, I, I, to me it's remarkable that uh, many of the, virtually all of the things that you can prove about these laminations, these, mar these, I mean, these measures, Margulis measures and Bowen me measures, also have analogs in this complex, the setting of complex diffeomorphisms. Um, so I, I mentioned, for example, that the stable, the, the Margulis, the, the stable lamination for a hyperbolic diffeomorphism is uniquely ergodic, that is it has a unique invariant transverse measure. Uh, Forness and Siebeny proved a very nice uh, analog of that for, uh, for currents. Okay, so to state that, <coughs> let me describe a certain class of currents, which is the class we've been dealing with. Okay, so all the currents we've seen so far are positive closed 1-1 one, one currents. Well, um, positive one, a positive 1-1 one, one current, it's easy to, it has a nice geometric uh, meaning. Um, a positive 1-1 one, one current is a current which, when evaluated on a complex submanifold, gives a positive measure. Okay? So it's positive when evaluated on complex submanifolds. Okay, the, so for example, the, the fundamental class of a complex variety, if you evaluate that on a complex submanifold, you just get the intersection number, 
But the intersection number of two complex varieties is positive. Right? This amazing fact about complex varieties, the intersection numbers are always, always positive. So, um, well, now when I said that, I, I cheated a little bit because you can't always evaluate a current on a complex subvariety, but it wasn't the first time I cheated a little bit, so it's not. Okay. Um, okay, so, so these are positive current, closed currents. Again, just means that D is zero, thought of in the sense of, of currents. Okay, so positive closed currents, they're, they, they, whenever, okay, positive closed currents. So here's the, the theorem of uh, Fornes and Siebeny. If you look at, supported on J plus here, get my pluses and minuses consistent. If you look at the set J plus, okay, the, the, the perbulation thought of as a set, right, um, then mu plus, the support of mu plus is the set J plus, but in fact mu plus is the unique positive closed 1-1 uh, one, one current supported on J plus. Okay, so uh, just as in the case of laminations, this mu plus is determined completely by the set, right? Not by the dynamics. It's, deter it's determined by the underlying sets that are involved here, right? This definition has, makes no reference to F, to the diffeomorphism at all. Okay, the, um, somehow, uh, the, the, so the positivity means that it behaves well on complex submanifolds. The closeness is somehow related to the holonomian variance here. Okay, so this gives us a way of translating some lamination theory to turbulations. Okay. Okay, now another nice feature of mu plus is the fact that it, it is, comes from the property of its potential function. Okay, its potential function, g plus, is actually a continuous function. Well, that's, that's a nice property for, um, for, for currents to have, that they have a continuous potential function. In particular, it's a property that, that um, the fundamental class of a variety does not have. Right? The, in that case, we're taking log of a polynomial, well, log of where the polynomial goes to zero, the, the, function, the potential function is not continuous, it goes to minus infinity. So this has some geometric consequences. It means that this current, U plus, is better behaved than some other currents. In fact, it's even, in a way, it's from a point of view of an analyst, it's better behaved than the fundamental class of a variety. Right? From the point of view of a topologist, what could be simpler? than the fundamental class of a variety. But here's, 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 here's what bothers analysts about the fundamental class of a variety. If you want to define the intersection of two varieties, you need to make sure, the intersection number, you need to make sure that the varieties don't coincide. Right? It's clear from topologists do that all the time without thinking about it. But analysts don't like that at all. They want to be able to define these intersection, I mean, <clears throat> makes, them, makes them very uncomfortable that these intersections that this, these intersections are defined sometimes and not other times. Okay, they get okay. <clears throat> they get nervous. I can testify. Okay. Mu plus does not have this property. Mu plus, it can be its intersection can be defined with any variety, and that's because it does not have this pull on the variety, because it has a continuous potential function. Okay? So uh, we can think of that geometrically as somehow saying that mu plus is a little more diffuse than the variety V. Right? The vi variety V is, it's, has a discontinuous potential function because it's so concentrated, and mu plus is, is diffuse. Okay, well one thing that means, <coughs> one thing we can, so we can, we can kind of intersect mu plus with varieties, we can also intersect mu plus with mu minus. Right? We have a corresponding um, a current for mu minus. So we can define simply in, in a kind of soft way, in a kind of um, <coughs> using uh, tricks that pluripotential theorists are <coughs> very familiar with, I mean, our, our second nature, we can define a wedge product of these two currents, uh, mu, and the wedge product of these two currents turns out to be a measure, okay? So a, a probability measure. 
and actually invariant measure on uh, defined on the set on the set J and it plays the role of the Bowen measure in the hyperbolic theory. Okay, so um, let me um, let's see, let me give you a theorem here which <coughs> explains, I mean, which, which justifies my assertion that uh, this measure mu is the right analog of the Bowen measure. Recall that the Bowen measure described the distribution of periodic points, periodic saddle points, say. Okay, so we have um, for this, in this complex, for this complex Hainan diffeomorphism, again we can consider periodic points of period n, okay, so that some set we can consider the Dirac masses placed at these sets, and that's some measure. I'm going to normalize here, actually the normalization I'm going to use comes from the potential theory. I'm not going to count, actually count these saddle points. I'm going to use this, just use this factor 1 over 2 to the n, which is natural in terms of, of the, the measure mu. And the uh, theorem is that this um, this measure, these measures on, on describing the distribution of periodic points converge to this measure mu, this, this mu plus wedge mu minus measure. Okay, so um, one of the corollaries of this result is that if we just consider the, the total mass of both sides of the equation here, that mu is a probability measure, its total mass is one, on the left hand side the total mass here is just the number of uh, periodic saddle points divided by this factor, 1 over 2 to the n. Okay, so we see that the number of periodic saddle points at period n divided by 2 to the n converges to 1. Okay, a very strong statement about the um, behavior of these, these, these periodic points. The, the fact that it's no larger than 2 to the n is an, is an algebraic fact, just coming from the nature of the, um, <coughs> coming from Bezu's theorem. But the fact that it's as large as that is a, a deep and significant dynamical fact. Okay, so as a corollary to this, we see that um, there exist uh, periodic saddle points of all but finitely many periods. Right? We have since this number is converging to one, it must eventually be larger than zero. Um, and that answers a question of uh, Friedland and Milner uh, about the complex Hainaut maps. Okay, so this is an example of something that's only going to be true in this complex setting because we really need all the periodic points in order to make this true. Something, if we take a real slice, then this is, this is definitely false. Uh, the question was, are we stuck with polynomials? Well, there are people who are working on rational functions, okay? But um, I would say basically we're st stuck with polynomials. Uh, no, we really, we're really using this pluripotential theory which depends very much on the under, on two things. One is the underlying complex structure. We need to take these forms and rotate them. Also, it depends on the behavior of these green functions at infinity. Right? With the, if you look at the growth of those green functions, the, this kind of calculation over here. And I was going to say that maybe if you could take the growth of the green functions and ask them to apply to this kind of LP class or something, or total level class. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the um, well, let, let me, so, so the growth of the green functions plays an important role here in, in what, what we've done. Um, I think there's a number of ways that uh, creative analysts could think of to extend these things, and, and uh, many people are working on that. Uh, 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 Fornas and Sibony are, are people who've uh, thought a great deal about that. 
my colleague uh, John Hubbard. Actually, I forgot to mention his name earlier in the talk, but um, this whole, I, I have to, I, I'm in serious trouble later, um, <laughs> but this, <clears throat> this whole idea, this whole idea of looking at, um, uh, you know, extending to the complex situation, I think uh, he, was, he was a person who, uh, who, who had that insight and also went around the world lecturing to people and gave a lot of people the thought that maybe this is a, a good, thing, good thing to do. How am I doing? Is that okay? <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, none of us would be anywhere without um, John's pioneering work. And uh, I should also say, uh, so I think it was really the idea of, of, of really applying the pluripotential theory in this case is, is really uh, due to Nesim Sibini. Uh, so, um, another founder of the subject without whom, uh, <coughs> well, uh, yeah, who's, uh, uh, right. Uh, so, so <laughs> but he's not actually here at the moment, I think. But another founder of the important uh, contributor, um, yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah, but there, so there are many direct, I mean, I've I'm, I'm really given you here a, uh, a kind of a bare bones um, or, or one minimal path to one family of results, but there's a lot of branches. So let me s mention briefly um, what, we'll, what we will have in the, the next two talks. Um, right, so, so we've been talking about, well, so we've extended one family of kind of hyperbolic theorems to this to this uh, to these family of maps. You shouldn't get that this the, you should not take the moral from this, this that these things are really like hyperbolic maps. It's just that um, I mean there are other properties of hyperbolic maps which are um, which definitely do not extend. There's certain there's symbolic dynamics. There's a certain natural coding of points. You can't. Uh, right. Th those properties do not extend to, to this situation. So, uh, one thing we would like to do is to see uh, cases in which um, this, uh, in which we have certain additional structure. Okay, beyond so what we've described here is a structure that exists for all parameter values. Um, you get the, I mean, you get this turbulation. But we'd like to look at certain si situations where this turbulation actually turns out to be a lamination, or turns out to be something close to a lamination, or um, pieces of it are, have a laminar structure. Okay, so from the analyst point of view here, what we've done something, we've done something like, um, if you think about analysts solving PDEs, one way they proceed is by finding a, a weak solution and then st studying that weak solution to see if they can't produce extra regularity. So what, uh, what we'll talk about in the succeeding talks is ways in which we can find some extra regularity in these, in these turbulations, okay? So that will give us some insight into how the dynamics changes with different parameter values. Uh, 
I mean, that, that is, the one, vari one, one variable dynamics, uh, there's a close relationship between polynomial like maps and genuine polynomials. In this theory, I don't believe there is such a close relation, so it does not, does not play such a substantial role. But for another point of view on the subject, you can talk to my colleague, uh, John Hubbard, who would argue in another direction. <laughs>